Okay. Um, welcome everybody to our Ask a Master Gardener Zoom webinar. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Um, our purpose today is to uh, answer questions uh, that folks are submitting to the hotline and have uh, you know direct questions coming in from you, the audience, uh, and see if we can answer those. Um, so before we start, um, Trink, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Yep. There you go. Okay, just a few housekeeping items. Um, please keep your microphone muted. Um, although if you do need to talk, uh, then you'll have to unmute yourself or we will unmute you. Uh, please do keep your video off. Um, that will help us to preserve uh, bandwidth. Um, you can use the speaker view. Uh, that may work the best for you. And uh, you can use the chat window to um, uh, lodge any questions that you have that you might like to uh, get answered. And we'll either answer them during the program or for sure by the end of the program. And just a few tips. The um, closed caption um, live script button at the bottom of your screen will turn on closed captioning. So you'll see uh, the written words as we speak them, uh, if that's helpful to you. Um, if you have technical assistance, um, you can chat directly to Trink. Now Trink, you'll meet her in just a moment, but uh, she shows as UCMG Monterey. Uh, and so if you send her um, a chat directly, then she can help you with a technical problem. Um, and we do plan to send this presentation to you in the email after the class is completed. So um, Trink, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I wanted first to just to, um, welcome everyone again and to tell you that about a little about us, the UC Master Gardeners, in case you don't know, um, most of you have probably been in other classes and might know this, but we are a part of the University of California system um, about, you know, five, 40 years ago, master gardeners were started in California through the UC system as a way of helping all of the farm advisors uh, answer questions for the home gardener uh, so that they could focus on doing what they do best, which is research and advising farmers. Um, so we have access to all of that wonderful University of California research. So our purpose is really extending that research-based knowledge and information to the home gardener and home horticulture. And we're looking at pest management, sustainable landscape practices, et cetera. These are all things that we're thoroughly trained in. And, uh, and then we as volunteers do things like this to extend that education. Um, we'll tell you a little bit more about how you can become a master gardener later in the program. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, my advancing here is <laughs> not really working right. Um, so forgive me, I'm gonna try to get the hang of this. Yep, it's not working. Um, yeah. and why this is happening. So, <laughs> So the up and down arrows aren't working? Yeah, the up and downs aren't working. Hmm. Um, can you use the mouse pad? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do, but my mouse pad is very sensitive. So mm -hmm. sorry, everybody. I am going to try to, ah, <laughs> this is so frustrating. Um, there, I, I, think I, I think I found a way to do it. There we go. Okay, so Doug, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, my name is Doug Lockwood. I joined the Master Gardener program in 2020, uh, which was the last round of, of Master Gardener training that, that happened right before the pandemic. In fact, the pandemic kind of bifurcated it. So we did the second half virtually. Um, I've been around gardening for a lot of years, um, growing vegetables, flowers, uh, herbs. Uh, I did landscaping professionally. Uh, at one point and studied landscape architecture and things like that. So um, currently um, I'm serving as what we call the hotline coordinator. So when inquiries come into the hotline, I make sure that 
you know, we're getting them answered and, you know, that, that we're relying on our internal uh, experts to put together good responses that we get out to you guys as soon as we can. Okay. Hey, Beth. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Beth McGuire, and I have been a master gardener since 2013. And during all these years, I have worked the hotline and I love it. It's sort of my thing as a master gardener. It's a little bit of um, CSI plant world. So I find it a challenge. I find it fun. It makes me think of plant problems I normally wouldn't think of. And it, it forces me to pay attention to areas that I like to ignore, like weeds and lawns and things like that. So um, I have 40 plus years of experience growing food, flowers, and herbs. And my special interests right now are in pollinator plants and small space gardening. Trink? And I'm Trink, and I've been a master gardener here in the Monterey, Santa Cruz area since 2012. And uh, I think I'm the newest one here, maybe only 30 years, <laughs> started late <laughs> of experience. And I just love to do this kind of thing, sharing what we've learned and the research that we've done with other people. So it's fun. We'll turn it back to Doug. Okay, um, before we start looking at some of the questions that have been submitted, we wanted to talk a little bit about the approach and the resources that we use to come up with the answers to the questions that that the public has. Um, and, you know, for sure, we want to present information that has been vetted and, uh, and demonstrated through research to be accurate. I think as everybody knows, there's a lot of tribal knowledge out there on the web and um, some of it may well be accurate, but um, some of it is not. So um, in doing our work, there's two websites uh, that are UC websites. If you could go back, Trink. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. The other back. Wrong direction, yeah. Yeah, the wrong. Ooh, yeah, there we go. Sorry. So there's two uh, UC websites that are our primary go-tos, and we're going to talk about those in the next couple of slides. These are websites that you can access and um, uh, hopefully find you know, quite useful in terms of accessing a lot of credible information quickly. Um, when we, and we'll get to that in just a minute, when we go outside of the, the uh, internal websites or these public websites um, that we'll be talking about, um, you know, we do a lot of web searching and a good way to find uh, information that is from universities and potentially from UC itself is to include the uh, term UCANR in web searches. So in the Google window, you put in UCANR and then the question you have, and quite often that will pop up a, a UC uh, website that's, you know, research-based. Another thing you can do um, as you find sites online is to look for ones that end in .edu because these are um, websites uh, from university, uh, universities around the world really, and particularly in the United States. And that is generally a good source of credible research-based information. So next slide. Can't believe this. Here, here you go. Okay, so the first website we want to highlight is called the California Garden Web. The URL is right there. Uh, when you, we send you the presentation, you'll be able to launch the website from um, that, that uh, link that's on the slide here. Uh, we suggest that you bookmark that so that you can easily get to the site in the future. It's, um, it's a really great site for, as a starting point for most gardening questions. Um, it has a search window uh, at the top, uh, that should be top right, <laughs> where you can enter things like the type of plant you're interested in or the subject you're interested in. Uh, click on the uh, uh, magnifying glass and it will take you to uh, a series of links that you can explore to you know, get to the answer that you're interested in. Um, and then there's pages essentially, um, of information and those are at the bottom of the slide. So particular focus on drought, on flowers, gardening basics, 
you know, things like indoor plants, landscape trees, shrubs and vines, uh, vegetables, uh, and even information on climate zones. So if you're wondering what climate zone you're in, um, you can go to this link and determine that. Uh, next page. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, that was a mistake. I was terribly sorry. Okay. But yes, the Garden Web website is live. <laughs> yes, as you can see. I think. Mm -hmm. I can't do this. Um, I think it's the, there you go. Okay, got it. Sorry about that. Okay, all right. And um, then, uh, but if your question is disease related or pest related, uh, this UC uh, IPM site, Integrated Pest Management Site, is the go-to place. Um, and that is the starting point for just a lot of great information. And it includes, you know, pictures, diagrams, things that you can use to uh, determine whether or not it is in fact a problem that you're researching. And then within this information, it will talk about management practices, causes, um, you know, basically what you can do about the issue. So it is uh, IPM approach, it's ecosystem based. So, you know, a lot of emphasis on uh, managing and preventing pest and disease issues and probably living with them to a degree versus, you know, spraying chemicals that may be toxic or, or hazardous in the environment. So um, like the garden website, it has a search box on the upper right. And um, another cool feature uh, on the IPM site is um, a, um, it is a, let's see, let's adjust my view. There's a, something called the plant problem diagnosis tool. So you, um, you check, check a series of boxes, you identify you know, the type of plant that it is and you identify the part of the plant that's affected and the type of problem that it is. And then out the bottom falls, uh, you know, potential diseases or insect problems that it could be. So that's uh, very helpful uh, to, to get to uh, the answer of what ails you. And again, uh, a lot of photographs and diagrams, you know, to help you to verify um, whether what you're seeing is the actual issue. So um, those are the starting points we use and it, it kind of you know, branches out from there. So um, you know, we've had folks submit uh, questions uh, prior to this webinar and we've got about nine or 10 of them that um, we've taken a look at, we're gonna discuss. Um, so I think the first, first one, uh, Beth, this is yours. That's the next slide. Yeah, we got this beautiful, beautiful picture. And um, first of all, let, let me say that sending a picture is much better than a long description. Um, the pictures are better than words doubly applies when you're talking to the hotline. And when you do send a picture, it's really good. Um, in this instance, we didn't really need it because it's a kind of a a fairly familiar problem, but it is good to actually take a picture up close of the um, problem. And then sometimes it's great to get a picture that where you've backed up a little bit and we can see some context. We can see how the, uh, the tree or the plant meets the soil line, what's surrounding it, because sometimes there are some clues in that picture that um, you may not have thought might be, be relevant. So as we, we talk about these um, issues today, um, we might have some more questions that the, the pictures didn't necessarily help us with. But in this particular case, um, the, um, the fact that this is a pear and that the damage looks the way it does 
is a, a real giveaway. Um, it, this is a, a softball question for a master gardener, I guess. And hopefully after tonight, it will be, you'll recognize it too. So the next slide, Trink. Um, this is fire blight. And doesn't the picture in the UC uh, Integrated Pest Management website look almost exactly like the picture that was sent in before? Um, it really um, is an excellent thing. So, but anyhow, one of the giveaways was that there, um, this was on a pear. And so fire blight is really common to things in the palm fruit family, which will include things like um, apples and pears and pyracantha is in that family. So when you see these dead looking branch tips, um, that is fire blight. Um, and, and it's an infection. Um, it's spread by bees through the blossoms on the trees. So that's when it's spread, usually sort of during wet weather. Um, the best way to avoid this is to actually look for a type of pear or apple that um, is resistant to fire blight. Um, that's not always possible. You might already have a mature tree. Um, and so if you do uh, notice that there's fire blight, the very best thing to do is just to prune out the um, dead portion of the the dead portion of the um, the dead branch and then excuse me for the the background noise and also it is possible to treat with a weak copper solution like a Bordeaux mix um, but that is probably a second choice in that copper accumulates in the soil after a number of years so um, uh, uh, at any rate, uh, one important thing is if you are doing some pruning is to actually uh, disinfect your pruning tool in between cuts because you don't want to spread the disease from plant to plant. That's generally a, a good thing is to make sure that your sanitation is good when you're doing pruning projects. So. And um, Beth, I'd also recommend that the link here to this pest notes on the fire blight that the requester or anybody who has this problem really read through that carefully because um, it's, it's sad that there's not much more we can do about this other than the pruning that's, it's very hard to get rid of, but uh, keeping on it will often, keeping on the pruning as it shows up will often uh, get rid of it. So, yeah, wonderful. This one's uh, mine, so I took this question on something's eating my seedlings. This is often a question <laughs> that we get uh, at the hotline or in, in, for any gardener. Um, and this is from Debbie. Uh, is Debbie with us today? Do we know? It doesn't look like she is, no. Okay, great. So she said that something's eating her veggie and flower seedlings, which often happens. She's got raised beds that are protected from rats and rabbits and mice, which are great, meaning uh, she sent a picture and they're, they're covered so uh, rabbits and rats couldn't get in it. And so in this particular case, though, um, she's assuming that something is coming at night because she's not seeing anything at the day daytime. And she's asking, can she spray? So here are the pictures that she sent, just as Beth said. Oh my gosh, it's so much easier um, to answer our questions if we have pictures. So kale and nasturtium and zinnia. And um, these are really kind of different. So the kale and the zinnia um, appear to have been nibbled at. They're distorted. There's a kind of round circle in the zinnia. The kale kind of uh, has taken a chunk out. But the nasturtium is not eaten. It's something different. So, and again, this middle one, this nasturtium is a pretty easy one for master gardeners to answer. The other two a little harder. So um, I teach uh, an IPM uh, class, a couple IPM classes with another master gardener, Delise. And um, we have fun with them and we're giving one fairly soon in another couple of weeks, we'll give you the date at the end of the class. But this is a slide from our presentation for that class, which I've included a link to down below um, so that you can actually, if you want, go in and look through the slides for that presentation. But this particular slide we use to show that sometimes it's hard when you just look at the damage on a plant to tell what it is that's eating it. 
Um, the one on the left is an earwig. All of these are plants in the cabbage family. And you can see they're kind of similar, aren't they? The damage that you're seeing them. The one is earwig, one is slug, and one is a cabbage butterfly in the larva stage. So um, you can't always just look at that damage and say, oh, we know what that is. Um, and if you try to address it, if you make an assumption that the one on the right is a, caused by earwigs, well, you might then put out earwig bait or something and you might find it's not doing any good because in fact, that larvae is not gonna eat um, that earwig bait or the slug bait. So it's a different answer. So with IPM, you often want to first figure out what it is that's causing the problem. Now, one of the ways, again, that you can do this is to go in and um, use that diagnosis pro uh, um, technique tool that on the IPM website that's very helpful. But uh, here in this case, um, I think the probable answer for the kale and the zinnia is earwigs. Um, and she says she's not seeing anything. And it, it, well, let me back up. It, so to find out what it is, the best way is really to go out at night, because that's when things like earwigs and um, uh, slugs and snails are out there in the garden. So take your flashlight out at 10 o'clock or so, maybe the last time you take your dog out to pee for the night, and just, you know, start looking around down there. Look under the leaves, look at the base of the leaves, uh, and, and see what you can find. Um, and it, it, so... In this case, given that she has, and I'm not showing you her raised beds, but I think looking at her raised beds in the wood, um, it's most likely that this is earwigs. And uh, so how you address earwigs, and again, there's a pest note link at the bottom, which will give you more detail. But first of all, remove habitat around it that they could be hiding in. So that's ground cover, even boards, pots, things like that. This is true for, um, slugs and snails as well. And trapping the earwigs in rolled newspaper or bamboo or cardboard tubes, something that you know gives them a nice hiding place because often in raised beds where they're hiding is right next to the wood of the raised bed. And if you can give them a place to, uh, tr to um, hide besides there next to the wood and the, and the uh, uh, dirt, then you can empty it in the morning and destroy them. Another possibility is a trap that's made with vegetable oil and a little bacon grease or fish oil buried to the rim of that, of the, of the dirt. So, um, of the rim of the trap. So uh, that's, an, uh, that's another good approach. Finally, if you want, you can move to commercial bait and um, sluggo is an example of this, um, but sluggo plus has actually spinosad in it, which is something that does organically treat the earwigs. So it's not gonna cause any da damage or um, release anything into your vegetable bed that could be harmful to you. So um, that's uh, a, an effective way to address them if you can't trap them and, and, and that's frustrating. The nasturtium problem is a little different. Again, it's not something that's munching from the outside that's creating holes. It's something that's going inside. Leaf, it's called leaf miner. Uh, again, we have a pest note on that that you could read. The adult leaf miner is a small black and white fly and it lays the eggs inside the layers of the leaf. And uh, then the larvae hatch in there and they eat the inside of the leaf. If you ever see this, you can actually try to take apart the leaf and you can find that larvae in there. It's pretty interesting to see. Um, that mining, now, and by the way, this is something, nasturtium is just one, um, one plant that these attack. Most likely for a vegetable gardener, you're going to see them in uh, spinach, um, many of the, le the leafy, the greens. So spinach, chard, chard, <laughs> uh, beets, uh, things like that. So you can, again, look at the pest note and kind of find out which they are. But the mining there doesn't usually kill the plant and the best way thing to do, it's so hard to have any kind of, you know, uh, organic or non-organic chemical get inside that leaf that you can't get to 
killing that larvae in the middle. So they're hard to get rid of. The best thing is to do once you have them, the best thing is to do is get rid of those leaves and just try to control it. Um, so you could put, once you have a seedling in the garden that you think could be uh, a victim of a leaf miner, you can put protective cloth over it and try to keep that fly out. That's the best way to deal with it before it starts. Um, so that's uh, nasturtiums. So, um, and so Trink, I was gonna to mention too, there are predatory insects that eat leaf miners. Say that again, I'm sorry, Doug. So there are predatory insects that eat ah. leaf miners too. Very good point. Yes, there are. So the predatory insects are beneficials um, that eat um, some of the bad guys are one of the reasons that you really want to keep chemical use in your garden to a minimum um, because it's going to kill the beneficials as well, as well. And nature, you know, is in balance pretty much by itself. There's sometimes we need to help it along, but um, you really, you want to keep that garden nice lovely for the beneficials as well. So back to Doug, I think, huh? Hmm. Okay, um, is Carol on the call? No, I, don't, I don't think she's joined at this point. Okay, this question came from Carol and it's a picture of a plum tree that um, has a, a sort of a splitting going on in the bark. Um, she indicates it's a mariposa plum. It was bare root in 2020, so it's a fairly young tree. And there's just areas where there's splits in the bark. You can see the lighter colored, um, uh, lighter coloration under the uh, split in the bark. And she's asking what causes the splitting and what can be done about it. Um, you know, some of the questions that we have that um, we haven't, um, we don't have all the information on this, but some of the things that would be very interesting and helpful for us to know is, is this the um, south or west side of this tree? Uh, because we suspect this has to do with damage uh, that's from direct solar radiation on the tree. And that would help to confirm it. And, you know, how old is the tree? I think we have a good idea of that. You know, was there something that was shading the tree that has been moved? Um, that, in other words, a change of condition for the tree so that the bark is now having to handle a higher load of, of solar radiation. Um, so next slide, Trink. Okay. Um, so this is probably sun scald or sunburn and uh, very likely sunburn. Um, and the difference is um, both both of, sun, of these sun scald and sunburn will cause this kind of damage. Um, sun scald is something that can happen in freezing temperatures when the sun hits the uh, bark of the tree. So you have uh, you know, a tree that uh, the temperature has been greatly reduced and then suddenly it's being warmed uh, by the sun and pinging on it. Uh, whereas uh, sunburn um, is where uh, the tree is exposed to solar radiation and high temperatures. So in other words, a very hot day, very hot sun um, impinging on the bark. And this can definitely affect trees like a plum that are thin barked. Uh, their bark is thin and it is more likely not only, you know, if that part of the tree has been exposed directly to the sun, but also if there's not sufficient water, if the tree is not sufficiently hydrated, if you will, that increases the chances of sunburn happening. As you can imagine, you know, the, the uh, moisture in the tree bark is something that enables it to, you know, withstand things like heat conditions. And if that's, uh, if that's deficient or if it's lower than it could be, then that can contribute to this bark damage. Um, Either way, uh, sun scald or sunburn, the the, um, the damage is very similar, and you know, sort of the prognosis and the what to do is similar too. Um, what what folks can do, what Carol can do, is uh, either shade the trunk in some way if that's feasible, 
or use something like a commercial tree wrap um, to protect the damage area. Um, and that's again to reflect the sunshine so it doesn't impinge directly on the, the area of the tree that's already damaged. And we recommend not using uh, any type of uh, sealing compound like a tar on the wound. I think that's a general um, recommendation because what happens is inevitably that tar pulls away from the bark. It doesn't really adhere to it. And then you have a nifty little pocket for moisture to um, uh, accumulate in. And it's a route for insects and pathogens too to uh, enter into the tree and cause, cause diseases. Um, so our recommendation is, you know, use the commercial tree wrap, uh, protect the damaged area and monitor the tree and see it, it may recover. It really depends on how extensive the sun scald uh, damage is, um, but it looks like a tree that's worth saving. And Doug, may I ask a question? It seems that um, this happens more frequently when there the tree is perhaps not getting sufficient water. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also when it's young and there isn't much canopy yet to protect it. Yeah. And my experience on um, hotline, um, I get this question more often than any time uh, any time else with avocados. That is like a huge thing if you're trying to, to grow an avocado. And typically, just as you're planting, you'll paint the trunk with some latex, white latex paint that's half diluted with water just to prevent this problem and, and not have it occur. Yes, it, um, you know, it happens uh, with young trees. That's probably the primary demographic that's impacted. And, you know, a, a tree can be in a nursery and, you know, essentially be shaded and protected from the direct sun. And then, you know, it's purchased, it's brought home and planted and suddenly it's, you know, it's there getting blasted um, by, by the sun. So, you know, cautionary uh, thing to do is to anticipate that and go with the white paint or the tree wrap when the tree is first, you know, um, uh, put into the ground okay. to prevent this from happening in the first place. Yep. Okay. Okay. I'm having advancing problems again. Here we go. Ah, okay. This one is mine. It's Beth again. So um, there were, um, somebody wrote in and said that there were some tiny back black worms on her budlia, um, butterfly bush. And um, they're weaving, whatever insect it is, they're, they're weaving a web around the blossoms. And um, the plant is in a large pot that's been moved from the uh, sun to partial shade to full shade and back again. Um, it's never been really healthy, the person says. Um, and that right now it's in partial shade. Linda, are you um, listening on this call? I don't see her. On okay, you don't see Linda with a Y. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so this is the, um, the on the left is the bud that Linda was describing where it's been wrapped in a web. And on the right, um, the butterfly bush, the budlia is the center pot there. And um, what we are um, diagnosing that it's a possibly a webworm. Um, there is a UC IPM uh, uh, link for webworms that, that you can look up. Um, but in general, what you wanna do is you'll just go ahead and clip off the damaged portion you don't want to put that um, that blossom with the the little black worms uh, or web worms into uh, your compost pile because your home compost pile is not going to get hot enough usually to destroy the worms. So what you do want to do is dispose of it in the municipal compost. Usually, most people will put it in some sort of plastic bag, a bread wrapper, or something you're going to be tossing anyway. 
But um, the bigger uh, question is, um, is this the right way to be growing your Buddleia? And we um, would suggest perhaps thinking of putting it into the ground. Usually Buddleias get quite large, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 feet tall and, you know, six feet wide. So it's not going to be happy in the pot. And a lot of these insect problems are not um, a cause of a, um, a plant dying so much as they're a symptom of a, an ailing plant. Um, the, the insects are often opportunists. And so by giving this, um, this budley a full sun, uh, plenty of room in the ground for its roots to grow, the proper amount of water, um, it'll be much happier. There you go. Oh, ah, and I forgot to mention the um, a local nursery um, diagnosed it as bagworms, but it didn't look like bagworms. You can look that up in the integrated pest management database as well. Um, let me see. And we also told Linda to go ahead and watch for um, any kind of further problems that that might develop because perhaps our diagnosis is is incomplete. So. And Ian, I, this is a master gardeners debate various things together, which is makes it fun. And uh, I would recommend, in fact, here that these would be put in the municipal garbage rather than in the green waste, because I don't even think municipal um, uh, composting gets hot enough for certain bugs. So I think it's certain it's what I do. What I do is if I've got a really damp uh, a insect infested, pest infected plant, um, I just, I'm putting it in the garbage because I don't feel like, I want to share that with other people who might pick up compost from the garbage and because I'm not sure, if you know your municipal compost gets really hot, that's, you can rely on that, but I'm not sure they always do. Uh, that's my, so this one's uh, Doug, I think. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so Alita sent in a question about this uh, blueberry that um, is looking pretty sad. Um, and, you know, she indicates that uh, it's just been in the ground since last fall and that um, the buds opened, but then they died and the leaves have not been growing. So the quality of the picture here isn't great, but it does appear that these stems do have some green to them. So we suspect the plant is not dead, but it would be good to uh, verify that, for instance, by just breaking one of the branches and seeing if it's green or white inside the branches. But, you know, uh, whether or not that's the case, um, you know, sort of the first question is, um, what it, where is this planted? It appears to be directly in the ground Although it may be in a raised, um, a raised bed, those bricks being, you know, kind of the border of a raised bed, so we don't really know. The relevance of that, though, is it's really difficult to grow blueberries directly in the ground um, out here where we live. Um, you can do it back east, but out here uh, it's much more difficult, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, we're also curious what cultivar of blueberry this is. And the reason for that is that uh, there's a number of them and most of them require a lot of um, frost days, basically chill hours uh, in order to break dormancy. And there are a few cultivars though that are more suitable for you know, our, our environments out here that do not have that chill hour requirement or at least not nearly as much of it. But that can certainly affect how viable a plant would be. We see it all the time with fruit trees as well. Um, you know, we're wondering uh, how this plant's being irrigated. Um, you know, because uh, blueberries, they really need to be kept moist. And this looks pretty dry. So, you know, we'd like to know um, what the irrigation regime is you know, how much and how often. Um, and then fertilization is important too. So 
the relevance of uh, whether or not this is planted above ground or in the ground um, is primarily has to do with um, the pH issue. Blueberries want to be, or they do best in a pH of 4.5 to 5.5, so mildly acidic. That's hard to do in the ground. Um, our ground in our area tends to be neutral or basic at best. And it's difficult to acidify uh, the ground and to do it in a sustained way. Um, whereas um, if you have the plant in a, an above ground container, you know, either a raised bed or pots of some kind, then it's much easier to control that environment and to um, reduce the pH and keep the pH in the desired zone by adding things like peat moss and coffee grounds and pine needles uh, and so forth. Um, go to the next slide, Doug. Sorry? Should I go to the next slide? Uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide. Are you on it now? Yes, I am. Okay. So, I mean, just to kind of summarize, you know, blueberries do best in acidic soil. So that's one recommendation to make sure, do a, do a soil test and find out. Um, and if it's uh, in the ground, you know, this is just gonna to be tough, but you can try to keep uh, the conditions correct for the plant to thrive in ground. It would just do better in an above ground container. In fact, I was gonna mention commercially um, in California, blueberry growers have gone to all above ground containers for just this reason. Um, you know, the soil appears to be uh, really kind of dry. It doesn't look like it has much organic material. Uh, for the blueberry to do well, it really needs to be kept moist, uh, but not soggy. Um, and, you know, using a layer of mulch on the surface of the ground around the plant or the surface of the soil around the plant <clears throat> on the surface, but not up against the uh, trunk itself, which is kind of a no-no, uh, would help to retard uh, moisture loss. And then, you know, the issue of irrigation uh, is very, very important. Um, ideally, this plant would be being irrigated once a week. The roots are um, fairly shallow, so it is quite susceptible to drought. If the top, you know, eight to eight inches to 12 inches dry out, then the plant is dried out. So um, regular watering and then um, when the tree is putting out buds, it really, sh or the uh, plant is putting out buds, it really should be watered twice a week, uh, or, you know, the buds may uh, wither and die. And it sounds like that might have been what happened here. Okay, thank you. Good one. I think this one's yours, um, Doug, yep. again? Yes. Or okay, great. Yes. Okay, um, so let's see, is Renee in the audience? I think she was going to try to join, but perhaps she hasn't been able to yet. Um, so anyway, she sent this question about Italian buckthorn plants, and you can see that they've got what looks like an infection uh, on the trunk. Um, and uh, it, in her, uh, information she submitted in addition to what you see here, she described it as, you know, kind of moist and oozing. And she also mentioned that she has other buckthorns in her yard and some of them are still thriving, but some of them are starting to show the same symptoms. So, you know, we're interested in when the damage first appeared and whether, um, uh, there are different varieties of buckthorn planted because it may be that some of them are um, disease resistant, which would be a uh, Doug, we lost you. And we're also interested in how compacted the soil is because that bears on how well it drains and that 
uh, could be a factor in what's ailing this plant. So the next slide, Trink. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, based on the information we have, we think this is what's called Phytophthora crown rot. It's due to a pathogen, it's a soil borne pathogen and it affects the crown of the plant. And you can see a picture down in the lower right there of the slide. Um, and it can cause root rot as well, um, which this, this plant could indeed have. So it's exacerbated by compacted or poorly drained soils. Um, now, there is a way to tell if that's what this is. There's actually a bioassay this enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, uh, which is used to um, evaluate the biochemistry and the antibodies present uh, in the sample and determine whether in fact it is Phytophthora. So that would be a, a recommendation if she really wants to be sure what it is, is to <clears throat> do that test. Um, uh, she did also ask about you know, having somebody come and look at this situation with these buckthorns. Um, and that's a good point. Master gardeners, you know, we're not able to make site visits, but we do maintain a list of, um, of certified arborists in our area, uh, which is, you know, freely available to anyone that needs that information, then you can contact them yourself. And we also have a list of uh, laboratories that do soil analysis. Um, and that's a great starting point in general, just to know uh, what you have in your soil, what the pH is and what the balance of, you know, minerals is and the soil type and so forth. Um, and that information is freely available too, and we can provide that. So, and again, if she decides to replace this with another buckthorn, then we would, you know, recommend finding a resistant variety. Um, and if this Phytophthora is indeed in the soil, then any plant that's put uh, in that area, you know, ideally would be um, resistant to this, this pathogen. Right. Okay. One thing, Doug, could I make a, a, a quick comment is that uh, I have noticed sometimes when people have a situation like this where they have a hedge where most of it is thriving and then one or two, um, of the plants are dying is the first thing I recommend is to check any irrigation if it is getting irrigated because a lot of times that will tell you there's maybe a break in your ir irrigation system so something is either getting no water or it's getting enormous amounts of water which could ca help cause phytophthora as well yeah. but um, you know this this um, person Renee has a control group right there. So by kind of taking a, a trowel and digging around the soil and, and observing the plants, how much sun they get, um, maybe there's something different, like something's gnawing on one of the trunks, whatever, yeah. um, she might be able to do some good detective work. Yeah. Great. Okay. okay. Great. Um, this is Another question, our next one, we have, I think, two left. And this one was about frost dates um, from Joanne. And um, so I don't have a lot of questions for Joanne. So I'll just go ahead and maybe at the end, Joanne has some comments. Um, she was asking, is it possible to accurately know the first and last frost dates in her neighborhood? So neighborhood as opposed to region, she lives in a low property in Aptos Hills and this year she had frost on May 20th. She said that damaged some of her transplants and she ended up telling us in a subsequent email that it, they were basal. So some of her basal transplants got damaged and others she could save. She also said she had a light frost in um, beginning of June. So she recognizes she's in a microclimate and she knows that her neighbor who lives up the hill uh, records five degrees higher. So this is something really for all gardeners to be aware of and particularly in our area, we can have a lot of different microclimates with uh, properties that are on a hillside. Uh, you might have 
you know, much lower temperatures on one level than you do at the top. So your frost is going to be worse there. It can also be a benefit though. So you may have, um, be able, for example, to grow fruit trees that need more of chill factor in winter at one level in your property versus, versus another. So there's sometimes some benefits to those. Um, so just thought it was a good opportunity to explain what frost dates are. And it's an average of the last light freeze. So they work from light freezes in the spring or first light freeze in the fall. So it's an average really of over 30 years um, from the material data that's collected from NOAA, the National Oceanic Administration and Atmospheric Administration. And um, their data, you can go right to the to NOAA website and find this data, and you can actually download and look for specific kinds of data yourself. But it is challenging to to uh, to work with to get exactly what you want, particularly something like frost. So there are a number of commercial interfaces to that NOAA website, that uh, websites and apps where you can just enter your zip code or your town and then they'll come back with that information. But you should explore to find out what station that particular interface is using what, and to be able to figure out how close is it to you. And again, within our area, if um, I compare, you know, I'm a few blocks from the beach and I compare frost dates here up to somebody who's at the top of Aptos Hills, it's going to be quite different. So we don't have a lot of stations in our area. They're kind of spread out, but we're lucky that we have, because we're in we're close to Watsonville or, and, and Salinas as well, we're going to have a few more stations in other places because the, the farmers rely on it, a lot of the information there. So um, there's a website here at UCIPM that actually gives you some information about this kind of data. It's not just frost dates that agriculture needs. They need um, dates in, in, in the term of this, when certain bugs are going most likely to be able to be coming out um, to protect their trees. And then here I've just included so what a definition of a light freeze is versus a moderate freeze and versus a severe freeze. Um, so just for your information. Now, this I just wanted to show in terms of frost date. It is all, frost dates are just a probability of the probability of the temperature going below a temperature threshold after a given date. So if you're looking at a temperature, for example, of 32, your first frost date, there's a 90% chance that um, the frost would happen uh, uh, after this January 16th date, um, the first frost would happen. I'm sorry, let me say that differently. By that January 16th date, there's a 50% chance it would happen by December 10th, and there's a 10% chance that it would happen by November 6th. So you can see how that works. In terms of that last frost, you can see that it, mostly it's gonna be gone by December. Uh, it's possible to go over into February, a 10% chance it would go to April. Obviously, she's in an area, you now this at the bottom I have here, this, this is from a Watsonville station on Freedom Boulevard. So she's gonna probably be at a lower temperature and um, she ran up into this June, odd uh, June. Now, but they're also anomalies. If there are some weird frost dates like it, it, she seems that seem to happen in her area, they may not show up in this data. So. Um, it's kind of a, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's not a perfect system. <laughs> You're not gonna get the exact answer. Um, and so what I would recommend here is that she calculate the temperature variance between her property and one of a nearby station, if she can do that. By looking back at data, checking it herself, uh, over a few days and then looking back uh, at the data and then use an app to provide that you can actually get a customized frost warning. So you can download an app and put in when you want, what temperature level you want to be notified that there's a probability of frost. Um, so that's just one way to do this, but also just understanding how this, this system works is um, I think part of that answer. Uh, and then there's more information about what to do to, you know, cover your plants and protect them when a frost happens. So that was the frost question. Well, um, so Trank, uh, I think Joanne's on the call. I wonder if she oh, has any questions. 
Joanne, if you want to unmute yourself. Okay, I thank you so much for all of this information. Um, I am near Freedom Boulevard in Watsonville. Uh huh. So, uh, you know, I'm at the south end of Aptos. Right. I think that is a good thing for me to do to, you know, um, measure what I have and what they have. Yeah. And yeah. That, because that May frost really was a surprise to me. Yeah. And well, I don't want any surprises. <laughs> I kind of want to know, and then I'll protect the plants. But this was extremely helpful. Thank you so much. Good, I'm glad. Take a look at the map too. This uh, station on Freedom Boulevard is really further up Freedom Boulevard within, almost in, into uh, Watsonville itself. But they, they, you can find the actual data on each of these stations, what elevation it's at, uh, what exact um, coordinates it's at, et cetera. So you can get a sense from that. Yeah, good, I'm glad it was, thanks. Take a panel. Okay, and um, I'm gonna very quickly do this question because we wanna do, we wanna leave a little bit of time for um, questions you might have that aren't on our PowerPoint presentation, but we did get a question about Agapanthus um, from Alex V. And um, the flowers were dropping off of his agapanthus and Alex sent a very good photograph of the, not of the whole plant, but of the flower. And I don't know what, what your impression is from this um, particular photograph, but if you go ahead and, and flip the sl slide now, we noticed that the um, chewing all seemed to be along the bottom and that the stems were very clearly cut. And we thought that most likely it's critter damage. Now, as you, those of you who have grown agapanthus know that the stems are really tall. So it's probably a little bit too high up to be a gopher or a ground squirrel. And it seems, um, and we do know that deer absolutely love agapanthus flowers, but we think that they probably would have eaten the whole thing, not, little dainty pieces off the bottom. So all we can guess is that um, there's a critter there that, you know, they might want to cage, Alex might want to cage his, his agapanthus or fence or even put out a um, critter cam of some kind um, for a few nights to, to see who's there and then uh, go to the IPM website and look up how to deal with certain pests, certain uh, vertebrate uh, mammals who might be eating his flowers. Sounds great. Okay. So should we see if anyone has a question they'd like to ask at, um, that we haven't covered? I know some of you didn't submit questions. So do you have some now? Unmute yourself if you would like. I would like to ask a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, my name is Elahe and I really appreciate all the help you're providing us. Um, I'm an avid gardener, but not a master gardener. So I cannot wait for you more information on how to become a master gardener. I have about 25 citrus trees I planted about um, six years ago. So for the first time they are about to fruit. Um, I do notice one of them has an insect that's just chewing on the leaves. You can just tell the part of the stem where the leaf is completely cleared and the rest of the stem has leaves. I treated it with neem oil, but that doesn't seem to be really effective. I was wondering if there is any known insect that just attacks citrus in general. Beth, you wanna take this one? There are um, lots of insects that, that will attack um, citrus. Um, just like the um, slide that Trink used, you know, being able to see the type of bite or hole that's in the citrus might tell us a little bit more about what kind of, um, of um, insect is attacking it. Um, it is very common for snails to, um, you know, enjoy citrus leaves. Um, there are also lots of aphids and sucking insects that will, will uh, go after citrus leaves. And um, actually, some of you may have heard about Wang Long Bing, a citrus greening disease, 
which we don't have here in Northern California, but um, there is a psyllid that spreads this virus and it has killed a third of the citrus in Florida. And for the last five to 10 years, the universities in both Texas and California have been working frantically to try to keep this pest out of, um, out of our states and out of our um, citrus groves. We ha do have the psyllid in Northern California, but the psyllids that have been here um, have not carried the virus. So, so far we have been lucky, but that it's a real important issue in the agricultural community. But my, um, my uh, recommendation for you, Alahai, is go to the Integrated Pest Management um, database and put um, holes in citrus leaves. And there will come up a, a whole list of things and it'll describe the different things that could be wrong with your citrus leaves. And most likely you will be able to get a visual match on your own. If that doesn't work, go ahead and take a couple of pictures and send it into the hotline and we'll be, be glad to um, give you our opinion as well. Thank you. D Doug, anything from you on this? Yeah, you know, I wanted to mention uh, in the chat, uh, Margarita Hunter um, is mentioning she has the same issue. And Margarita actually submitted a, um, an inquiry to the hotline, I think, in the last 24 hours. And it's a very similar situation. And there's actually a picture there. I don't know, Trink, I could go ahead and share it if you think that's appropriate. Uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead and do that? OK. All right. Okay, so Margarita, I, I don't know if you would like to unmute yourself and uh, tell us what's going on here. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. I've never spoken on any of this presentation, so this is my first. Um, yes, I have been, I live in Monterey, um, California. I love citrus trees and I have been trying and trying and trying to successfully grow citrus trees. I have about five on my property in various degrees of distress. Um, um, so I also have, uh, this one is, I'm not sure which citrus tree because it was in the pot for so long that I don't remember what it was, but there is another picture there that I sent of my Eureka tree and the Eureka lemon, and it was doing great growing and, and there's lots of fruit. And then all of a sudden I have leaves that, um, you know, something is eating the leaves, but mm -hmm. not only they're eating the leaves, after a while, the entire sort of small branch becomes, you know, does not have any leaves all of a sudden. So, and I am not sure what's going on. I'd be happy to provide more detailed pictures. You no, know, you know, one question I have, I mean, something's clearly eating on this plant. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you're irrigating the citrus plant? Yes, I have um, drip irrigation. Um, and I don't know, you probably could see some of the solutions that I was trying to use. I use drip irrigation and it's usually once a week, about 15, 20 minutes. And is how many emitters, for instance, for this plant, how many emitters uh, would, would actually irrigate this particular plant? A two. Okay. And would that be like a gallon per hour type emitter? Do you happen to know? Um, I don't know, but I can probably find out. I, I would hope that it is about a well, I don't know, actually. Yeah, I, you know, it, the, the bush does look uh, desiccated and it may even be that uh, that's causing, there, there's with leaves when they fall off because things are too dry, it's called an abscission layer and the leaf actually just drops off the plant. Um, with lemons or citrus plants in general, the, um, they need a fair amount of water and their root system, you know, for most plants, the root system extends laterally sort of out to the drip line of the plant, right? Uh, but with citrus, it extends maybe half again that far. 
So you actually, this plant actually has roots that are going underneath that fence behind there. They're probably going all the way over to the bush on the right. Uh, and they're coming out towards us, you know, probably three to four feet. So to adequately irrigate this plant, um, you really need to apply water over this root zone and, and do it sufficiently to soak down so that it's into the root zone. If you, if you put too much water on it so that the water goes below the root zone, it's really wasting the water because it's not doing the plant any good. Um, so <clears throat> that's one thing you could, you could try is to um, make sure that these, these plants are being adequately irrigated. And I just don't think the drip system is going to do that for you. And Doug, I would, um, I would ask her too, whether, are the, are the leaves just dropping or are, because I don't see like damaged leaves here. I see discolored leaves. On yeah. this particular, may I say something? On this particular plant, um, the leaves are just dropping. On my Eureka lemon, they are being eaten. Okay, just remember, you know, you may be de dealing with multiple problems here. Um, at, Doug is expressing uh, in the watering, you'll see that with the leaves turning yellow on the ends and then dropping off. Um, but I see some, you know, discolored leaves, a kind of chlorosis that uh, I would ask, are you feeding the, uh, the plant at all? Yes, I do. I follow, I buy citrus fertilizer and mm -hmm. follow the, um, um, instructions on the bag, which typically says four times during the growing season. Okay, and then the question is, you know, how are you feeding it? But sort of if they're granules, and then all you're doing is the drip irrigation, that's not going to get, that food is not going to get down into the uh, soil sufficiently because you've got to water on top of the granules to have that granule melt down into the soil. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I typically water down, um, you okay. know, the after I put the fertilizer down and I kind of gently work it into the ground as well. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, maybe maybe that's not enough. Um, well, four, you know, four times a year should be okay. And you're following the directions, which is good. Um, and it's, you know, see, I, I, you know, it looks to me more like a feeding problem than anything else. There's a wonderful, uh, I'm going to take back um, screen share, Doug. Um, yeah, if I could just maybe mention, oh, sorry. you know, what okay. you, could, you could try, uh, uh, Margarita, you could try a foliar feeder. Oh, yeah. that's a good idea. A spray that you spray on the leaves and it's absorbed into the leaves. I mean, the granules that you're using, that's, that's the right solution for long term. But you can give this plant a quick shot of, of nitrogen. And, and, and really, there's, there are products. We don't endorse products, but products like, you know, uh, Rapid Grow or Miracle Grow that have most everything plants need. And it's all in liquid form. And it's foliar, so the leaves will actually absorb it directly. And... I think if you were to do that, you might see quite a difference in how this plant looks within, you know, a few days to a week. Thank you. I will definitely do that. We have um, another question. Roy submitted it through the chat and he wants to know how soon and by how much should he cut back the, his uh, Montalija poppy? I'm assuming, um, Roy, that you, it's the, um, Fried eggplant, they call it the common name is fried eggplant, the California native. Am I correct? You are correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, I love that plant. They are so much fun. I can't help but like smile when I see them. And it's so much fun to watch the bees forage on them. So are, are you getting flowers right now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it, did you just start growing them this year? No, they've been they've been in the ground for a decade and gradually spreading. Okay, yeah, yeah, they can be kind of aggressive, right? Sometimes you need to contain it. Anyhow, the um, what we would recommend besides asking master gardeners is the um, California Native Plant Society 
has a wonderful database and it has a lot of information on care for native plants. But um, there also is something called CalFlora, which is another UC um, website that you can use for questions like this. Um, but specifically to answer your question is usually in the fall um, or the early winter, people cut the poppies almost all the way down to the ground. And that way you're not nipping next year's uh, production. But you know the plant should almost disappear. You'll maybe only have you know maybe three inches of stem above the ground. I don't know if um, Trink or Doug have anything to add or or have a different how, opinion. Considering how aggressive and how well this plant does in our locality, what is the harm of cutting it back, say in August or July? Um, I don't know that it would necessarily be um, much harm, except that leaving the plant out so that the leaves can photosynthesize, I'm guessing that it's probably giving strength to the plant. You're giving it, you know, you're letting it go through more of its natural cycle. You can't kill the damn thing. Okay, go <laughs> ahead and cut it back now. <laughs> as soon as it's done flowering. <laughs> Like the flower, but it gets ugly. Yeah, it, yeah. 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 It, it does get kind of ragtag looking later in the summer, doesn't it? I think you're right, Roy, that you could cut it back as much as you wanted to at this point, and you might just cut it back somewhat to be smaller, and then it would be a happy medium. So you're still leaving some leaves to do some photosynthesis on it. Yeah. It's kind of like the same question you have with bulbs. You know, when do you cut back the bulb and uh, and the, the leaves of the bulbs. So. Okay. Alahe wanted to know the name of this poppy or the spelling of it. It's Monteliha poppy. It's spelled M-A-T-I-L-L-I-J-A, -I, -L -L -I, I believe. In the 1800s, it was going to be one of our uh, state flowers. Ah. South to the California poppy. <laughs> Okay, good to know. <laughs> good to know. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have some questions? Hmm. Um, I, I do have one question. The, the first person that spoke about the citrus um, was that Alahe? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, Alahe, I was just going to say, if you can uh, submit this as an inquiry to the hotline, um, and there's a link in the presentation that, that we'll show you, then we can send you information on irrigation and fertilization for citrus plants. Thank you so much. I will do that. You bet. Should we go on with the rest of it? Any other questions? Uh, mm -hmm. No. Really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going back to, uh, yeah, here we go. And, So let's just... May I ask another question? This yeah. is Margarita. Go ahead, Margarita. Um, I also am attempting to grow a pomegranate tree. Um, is there... And, and it looks beautiful. The bush looks absolutely gorgeous. But I have a hard time keeping the blossoms on the bush. With the wind, they keep falling off. And I'll unmute myself. It, it sounds, sounds to me like a, a potential uh, fertilization problem uh, or um, uh, nutrient problem. So 
making sure that it has, you've given it some good, um, uh, just general fertilizer, I think might help with that. Uh, and blossoms, as I remember, is uh, more phosphate. Yeah, um, I, I need to look that up, but if Beth if, or Doug, if you can confirm, yeah. or someone else in the call. <laughs> um, I think that's right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you might want to get a fertilizer with a slightly higher phosphate uh, content on it. So take a look at that. And, you know, if that doesn't do it, you might also, again, as Doug had mentioned, get your uh, soil uh, tested just to see what, what the balance is of the nutrients within your soil and what it may be lacking. So, okay. Well, uh, this has really been great. This is the first of these that we're going to be doing. We hope to maybe do them once a month. So uh, thanks for kind of bearing in with us on some of the, our technical issues. And please, um, we want to hear back from you on how we did, because if we continue to do this, we're, we definitely want to improve upon it. So how did this work for you? What would you like to see differently? And there is an evaluation survey that we'll put in the chat there uh, and that is also here on this uh, uh, presentation, which you'll get. Uh, and we ask you to fill that out for us, please, to let us know um, what you think. And also tell us either in the chat or on that survey form, what, um, what other classes you'd like to see that would be helpful to us. And then in a couple of months, you're going to get an e survey email to you from our Central California Master Gardener office because they will want to know, did you take what you learned here today and apply it and was it helpful to you? And these kinds of, this kind of data helps Master Gardeners get some funding to show the impact that we're having on home gardeners. So um, please fill that out when you get it. And here's a list of some future classes that we're doing. Tomorrow night we're doing a, it's really gonna be a great hummingbird garden class. So um, still you know, room for that. Nice thing about uh, Zoom classes is that there's plenty of room. So you can go to our website and sign up for that. Um, on July 13th, uh, Delise and I will be doing another integrated pest management. So some of the, often the problems that we get uh, in or I shouldn't say all, many of them, but a good portion of them are about pests and, uh, and diseases, as you could see from what we talked about today. So understanding that approach on integrated pest management is a really good thing to have in your pocket when you're a gardener and to know what resources you can go to. So come join us for that if you, if you can. Um, it's a fun class too. And then July 17th, we're doing, that's a Saturday morning, we're give, doing a gray water laundry to landscape class. And then sometime in July that we haven't yet set, we're going to be doing a, both a class and then an in-person uh, session of saving seeds from native plants. So that, that will be fun. Um, and finally, I mentioned that we're having another Master Gardener class. We have them every two years and we will be doing one in 2022. Uh, and we're taking applications now. So that blue taking applications is a link for you um, back to our website, or you can just go to our website itself and, um, and find out a little bit more about our classes and fill out an application if you're interested. So. Uh, it's a wonderful program. And uh, as all of you know, because you have gone to our website, when you get stumped, give us a call. Uh, and hopefully today you've learned too about what is helpful to us when you, I should, I said, give us a call. We prefer an email. <laughs> is In that email, we really would like to have you tell us um, as much as you can about the plant, about how you're irrigating it, what the soil is like around the plant. Uh, and of course, um, if you're fertilizing it, uh, and pictures, please. Uh, if you can give us pictures, that really helps in our analysis, as you can see here. So thank you all very much for joining us. And come back, hopefully, next month, and we'll do this again. Take a look at our website. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.